Hey everybody, this is Kevin Wallace, double CCIE and Cisco Press author. And one of the terms we hear a lot in the networking world these days is IoT or Internet of Things. But as you read that in a blog post or in some product literature, do you really have a good sense of what that means? What does it mean to be an Internet of Things? That's what we're going to cover in this video. Stay tuned. It's a term that we hear a lot in the industry these days, the IoT, the Internet of Things. And in this video, we want to take a look at what is the Internet of Things, how is it poised for growth in the future, and what sort of impact might it have on us as Cisco networking professionals. First of all, let's just think about what is the Internet of Things. What do you think of when I say Internet of Things? Well, if you were to ask me, I might think about my Ring doorbell. I installed that just a few months ago, and if somebody comes up to the door, First of all, I'll get an alert on my smartphone and on my Apple Watch that there's motion near my front door. And if somebody rings the doorbell, I'll get an alert about that. I'm able to see them. I'm able to monitor what's going on at the front door. There's a camera built in, a high definition camera. I'm able to listen or talk back and forth with the person at the front door. I had somebody not too long ago ring the doorbell and I was in my basement and I was able to talk with them. They were trying to sell something. So I was able to get rid of them without actually having to, to go to the door and, and talk to them face to face. That was pretty cool. But that's an example of an internet of things application. It's a connected doorbell. You might have the hue lights that allow you to turn lights on or off and to change the colors of lights. You might be able to control the uh, temperature in your home using a nest thermostat that you can control remotely. There's all sorts of examples of things that are now connected. Used to, they were a standalone device. You had a thermostat, you had a doorbell, and those were standalone autonomous devices. But now we're starting to integrate those things along with lots of other appliances like you see here on screen. We're starting to integrate those together into a service. It's not just a thing anymore. It's providing a service where we can monitor, we can control that remotely. And that monitoring and the controlling, that takes it from this thing that has this function, it turns it into more of a service. Oh, and also notice the car on screen. I heard a really interesting statistic about that. In the first quarter of 2016, there were more cars connected to a cell service than phones. I know that was hard for me to believe too, as I went and researched it. Here are the numbers. In the first quarter of 2016, of all devices connected to cellular services, 31% were phones, 23% were tablets, 14% of those cellular connected devices did machine to machine communication, and 32% were cars. So the Internet of Things, where we're getting more and more connected devices, it is here to stay. It's growing by leaps and bounds. And that's what we want to consider. First of all, let's think about some of the drivers that is making this happen. Why is this happening now? Well, for one thing, it's fairly easy to get high speed internet access. Like they said in the movie, The Field of Dreams, if you build it, they will come. Well, now that we've got these super high speed connections into our home, we're not using dial up anymore. Hopefully you're not using dial up. No, we've got broadband connectivity coming in, maybe through a cable modem, maybe through Google Fiber or something like that. But we can get really high speed, low latency, highly reliable networks in our home, in our businesses. And one way to leverage that available bandwidth is to connect more things to the network to use that bandwidth. And of course, more and more devices have Wi-Fi built in. And not just Wi-Fi, we've also got devices with cellular connections. In fact, here's one that just came to mind. I was recently diagnosed with sleep apnea, where I was stopping breathing multiple times during the night. That's kind of scary. But I got on this CPAP machine, and the CPAP machine has a little cellular radio in it, and it uploads my breathing data during the night when I'm wearing this little mask. It uploads that data to my pulmonologist that can take a look at it and go over that data with me. We've got all kinds of devices that have cellular capability and Wi-Fi capability built right in. And also... We've got more and more smartphones that people are using. Most people I know do not use feature phones. Well, my mother still does, but other than that, most people that I know, they use smartphones. And we can use these smartphones to control, to monitor, to interact with a lot of these IoT devices. And this Internet of Things industry is really, it's really poised for growth. Let me give you some stats on that. The Gartner Group has predicted that there's going to be about 26 billion connected devices by the year 2020. And uh, Forbes magazine 
reported that the IoT market is projected to reach $267 billion in sales of devices and services that work with IoT. $267 billion. That's over a quarter of a trillion dollars by 2020. And we've talked about some of the common applications that are out there. But let's think about some more. Let's talk about the top applications. And these are top applications as reported by Forbes. They say that the top three applications include predictive maintenance. This is where we can have monitoring systems on mechanical equipment. And we can monitor the performance of that equipment. And we can send alerts to the appropriate people when maintenance is due. This reminds me of my daughter's car. I get emails from my daughter's car fairly regularly that tells me things like, the tire pressure is low, I need to get that checked out soon. Or, the oil life is about to expire and I need to get an oil change. Those are some examples of predictive maintenance that we might have. Another one is self-optimizing production. Maybe you've got a large assembly line. You've got all these different flows coming together. Maybe there's a maintenance issue on one particular line that's going to impact something on another line. Well, by having these lines communicate with one another, things can be rerouted around whatever is failing at the moment. It's almost like a routing protocol where we're rerouting around a fail network segment. And another one of the three top applications is automated inventory management. The example that comes to mind here is, uh, is Heineken. When they sell a, a keg of beer, they have a monitor on that keg of beer that gets delivered to the bar. And they're able to monitor the amount of beer in the keg and monitor the freshness of that beer. And that way they can make sure that the bar never runs out. They can see exactly where the keg is, how much it has, how fresh the beer is. And that's a way that Heineken can better serve their bar customers by automating that inventory management and making sure that they get a new keg out to the bar before the current keg or kegs run out. And to make this discussion a bit more Cisco-centric, the technology that Heineken is using to do that is from Cisco. You see, Cisco recently acquired an Internet of Things company called Jasper. So now it's branded as Cisco Jasper, this collection of devices and services. In fact, Cisco has an Internet of Things and Applications division, and that's headed up by Rowan Trollope. And I was at Cisco Live in uh, Las Vegas in 2016, and he gave a great presentation. And one of the things that really resonated with me from that presentation was when he talked about the three different waves of how information technology has impacted business. The first big wave, if we could call it that, is sort of the computing wave. Back in the 1950s and 60s where businesses were getting these big IBM mainframes to offload processing tasks. You heard the term data processing a lot. You could have customer databases. A lot of the data was stored on tape. But it started to offload some of those routine tasks and automate those through computing. And of course, those computing technologies evolved through the 50s and 60s and 70s and 80s. And then in the early 1990s, when the first web browser became available, that's when the internet started to really impact business in the second wave. You might remember the term, the information superhighway. That sounded like something very futuristic, I remember, back in the 1990s. But by having this information superhighway, by having the internet available to businesses, suddenly businesses were better able to communicate with their partners and their customers, as well as communicate internally. And now in this third wave, the internet of things is having yet a different impact on business. Rowan Trollope says that the first two waves changed what we did. We changed how we did tasks through computing and through internet connectivity. But he says that this third wave, this internet of things wave, is going to change what businesses make. Computing and the internet really didn't do that so much. It didn't change the way that thermostats were made. Maybe we could make them more efficiently and get them to more customers, but it didn't fundamentally change the design of a thermostat. However, now with the internet of things, we're building in Wi-Fi connectivity, it's going to be controlled by a smartphone anywhere around the world. The Internet of Things is actually changing what businesses are going to make. So I hope you're convinced that the Internet of Things is going to have a major impact on business and our careers as well. So as networking professionals, what do we need to think about? Well, there are certainly lots and lots of implications, and there's lots of white papers you could read on that. Just wanted to touch on a few here in this video. One of the big ones is security. Think about it. We've got all these devices around the world, and they're on the Internet. That's a little scary when you think about it in terms of security. 
So we need to have good security so somebody doesn't come in and, and compromise maybe our home security system or something in our car. So security is going to be a big deal when it comes to the Internet of Things. And another thing that we need to think about is infrastructure. We need to have an infrastructure in place that's going to support all of these different applications. And one of the first things I think about when I think of the Internet of Things is, well, it's good that we've got IP version 6 addressing now instead of IP version 4 because there certainly would not be near enough IP version 4 addresses to go around. We were already out of IP version 4 addresses. We certainly couldn't start to assign those to our cars and our thermostats. But the great news is with IPv6, we've got plenty of IP addresses to go around. However, just because these IoT devices are running IP version 6, that doesn't mean that they've got a full-blown gigabit network interface card in them. That could take up a lot of power. That might take up more room inside of the device than the designer wants to give up. So there are some different protocols that we're starting to see with the Internet of Things. And I just wanted to touch on a couple of them. The first one is 6 low WPAN. And that stands for IP version 6 over low power wireless personal area networks. This allows us to put IoT technologies in a very small form factor that take up relatively little power. They don't have a lot of bandwidth, but we don't really need a lot of bandwidth maybe for some of the monitoring and the control functions that we're doing. So this is a protocol that you might run into, 6 low WPAN. And there's also a separate IPv6 routing protocol that we might see in a lot of our IoT devices. And it's called RPL, and that stands for Routing Protocol for LLN. And LLN, there's another acronym for us, that stands for Low Power and Lossy Networks. So we've got this IPv6 routing protocol for these low power lossy networks. And by the way, if you've got fairly recent Cisco iOS, I was trying it on one of my routers and my router doesn't have the current iOS to support it. But if you're running iOS, I think it's like 15.5 M and T trains. If you've got the right feature set, you can actually configure RPL. And again, this is not a comprehensive listing, but what I tried to accomplish in this video was to give you a sense for how real the Internet of Things is, how widespread its applications are, how much it's growing, and how it's going to impact us as network professionals. If you want to learn even more about Cisco routing and switching technologies, just click the link in the description or on the right side of the screen, and I'll send you more training videos. And also, if you don't want to miss any of my YouTube videos, be sure and subscribe. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.